morning. It's Monday, November 24th, 2014. This is your morning edition on I-24 News. Coming up later today, according to sources close to the talks, Iran, the United States, and other world powers are all but certain to miss today's deadline for negotiations to resolve the 12-year standoff over Tehran's atomic ambitions. Amidst much controversy, the Israeli cabinet approves a draft legislation that emphasizes Israel's Jewish character above its democratic nature, a move that risks undermining the fragile relationship with the country's Arab minority. And later on the show, a new study suggests that your gender plays a role in the feedback you receive as an employee. Good morning, I'm Yael Avi. We begin with the deadline for the Iranian nuclear talks. Iran, the United States, and other world powers are all but certain to miss today's deadline for negotiations to resolve the 12-year standoff over Tehran's atomic ambitions. It's forcing them to seek an extension that, according to sources, a closer talk may be announced this morning. Now, the talks in Vienna could lead to a transformation of the Middle East, open the door to ending economic san sanctions on Iran, and start to bring a nation of 76 million people in from the cold after decades of hostility with the West. But According to the New York Times, at least, the sources confirmed yesterday what officials close to the talks have been pre predicting privately for weeks, that a final deal is still too far to hammer out by the deadline, something that probably makes Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu very happy. We're joined in studio by research fellow at the Moshe Dayan Center in Tel Aviv University, Dr. Brandon Friedman. Good morning to you. Good morning, yeah. And before we break it down, let's take a look at the following report and take it from there. <laughs> As the clock ticks down to the final hours before the deadline for a nuclear deal between Iran and world powers, marathon talks continue in Vienna in an effort to fill the gaps between the sides, or, failing that, agree on an extension of the negotiations. Since February, the sides have been locked in talks to turn the interim Geneva Accord reached a year ago into a permanent agreement by Monday. Though diplomats have been tight-lipped about the details of the agreement, three topics have long been at the heart of the talks. Western states want to reduce Iran's capacity to enrich uranium to prevent it from reaching weapons-grade level. But uranium is also key in civilian nuclear implementations, which is what Iran claims it needs it for. A possible agreement could potentially allow the Islamic Republic to keep some of its centrifuges spinning, but cut their numbers down from more than 19,000 to around 4,000 and only allow them to reach low-level enrichment. Iran has been suffering the yoke of sanctions for years already, but they really began to hurt over the past two years since Western states began targeting its oil and banking industries, causing the real to plunge two-thirds against the U.S. dollar and sparking a sharp rise in inflation and years of negative growth. Tehran wants the sanctions lifted immediately, but Western states want it to be a gradual process ensuring Iran's ongoing cooperation. Though it is adamantly denied having nuclear weapons ambitions, Iran has developed long-range ballistic missiles and repeatedly carried out explosives tests and other activities that have been alleged to be part of such a program. An agreement would likely require Tehran to grant international monitors access to its military bases and nuclear plants. Iran has not provided any explanations that enable the agency to clarify the outstanding practical measures, nor has it proposed any new practical measures in the next step of the framework for cooperation, despite several requests from the agency. Chances are that the talks will be extended if no agreement is reached on time. But if diplomacy fails completely, the U.S. has always stated that all options remain on the table, and Israel has more than hinted that it would strike at Iran to prevent it from reaching a nuclear capability, which it sees as an existential threat. We are first joined in studio by Dr. Brandon Friedman, as said, from Tel Aviv University. Dr. Friedman, question to you. It's the 24th. It doesn't look likely as, it doesn't look like they're going to reach um, uh, an agreement at this point. But the sticking points remain. What, you know, you said that you've been, you actually said to me a few days ago that you, you spent a weekend researching the Iranian issue. Where does it stand right now? Well, look, I, I think that it stands where it stood basically for the last 12 years, which is, um, you know, until everything is negotiated, nothing is negotiated. Um, and so I, I think what we're looking at is essentially another, perhaps another 60 days of framework for which they can hopefully work out the issues that they're, you know, stuck on. I, frankly, I don't see it happening. What scares Israel so much, and I'm looking specifically at this country right now, when it comes to this deal and what supposedly is on the table? I mean, if we look into, at the report right now that says that some centrifuges will remain spinning, 
Where does it put Iran in terms of position, even in with the deal as such? As such? Look, Iran and, and the P5 plus one are essentially negotiating over numbers of centrifuges, what's known as the breakout, right? And you, if you ask me, the more important thing, the more important dynamic is what's not being negotiated. What's not part of these negotiations are weaponization. What's not part of these negotiations are access to Iran's military sites. What's not part of these negotiations, from what I understand, is Iran's ballistic missile program. Now, I could be wrong on that point. But it seems to me Iranians want to be negotiating over the number of centrifuges. Sure, they would like more centrifuges, and the West would like less centrifuges. But that's not the issue. The issue, t to my mind, is sneak out weaponization, the things that are not being discussed within the framework of these negotiations, which is why we in Israel seem to think that, you know, the least bad deal is still a bad deal for us. Is Pershing even in the... Um, uh, the no, Pershing frankly, is not in, for, for the in Iranians, none of the military sites are on the table. And so whatever transparency measures the Iranians are offering the West right now, the additional protocol plus, plus, plus, which is how it's being talked about, frankly, are not going to get to those places that need to be gotten to. And, you know, you mm -hmm. and I sit here many mornings and discuss ISIS and, and the battle against ISIS, and there's the speculation that the Americans truly actually need the Iranians at this stage if the battle against ISIS is to, you know, bear any kind, any type of fruits. Do you feel, and we're theorizing right now, that at, at, at a certain point, basically, we're just look, the West is looking to pull Iran in in order to win that battle? I think that's part of the Obama administration's thinking. But here's the thing, you know, the American, the Iranians need to defeat Daesh too. Daesh is on their border. The Iranians have invested a lot in Iraq. Why don't the Americans say to say to the Iranians, "Hey, look, Daesh is your problem. We'll leave them to you. We'll we'll look after the Kurds in the north, and the rest is yours." Yeah, but um, for that, they need a deal, most likely, with the Iranians. Yeah. Well, and maybe yeah. not. Maybe not. The the the the impression the Obama the Obama administration created is that the Iranians need to be in on this Daesh right. thing for it to succeed, and. So, in some sense, they've given the Iranians a lever in this negotiation process and suggested, by Obama's letter to Khamenei, suggested that perhaps that's what the Americans really are looking to do. So this idea of linkage may or may not be what the Americans see it as. And so, so the problem to me is that when you link the two issues, you're making it more complicated and harder to come to an agree agreement with the Iranians because you're suggesting that you want it more. Right, and uh, uh, clearly you know, th that you have something that you need to you, that you need to garner from it. Isn't it also dangerous if we're looking at Iran right now? Uh, you know, picking a side in the so-called sectarian divide that is in the in the Middle East. I mean, I'm, and I'm wondering if this deal is coming towards some form of, of fruition because the West understands that they need to pick this. They need to pick the Shiite side. Well, that's that's the Obama administration. That's the impression the Obama administration seems to create that they seem to think that Iran is essential to the new Middle East as they envision it. The problem is that, you know, the U.S.'s traditional allies since the 1990-91 Gulf War have been, you know, the Sunni Arab Gulf states, Saudi Arabia, Iran, Qatar. And so when you look at this nuclear deal, what the Arab Gulf, the Sunni Arab Gulf states see is an abandonment of, the, of, of an alliance that's worked pretty well for the last 20 years. Clearly. Uh, we're also joined from Vienna right now by Tal Shalev, I-24 News diplomatic correspondent, who's there in Austria to, uh, covering the P5 plus one talks with Iran. And Tal, everybody's saying that this is not going to be decided today. What are we looking at this morning in terms of announcements? Well, uh, the rumor is that uh, around between 12 and uh, noon and 2 o'clock in the afternoon, there will be an announcement actually only on in another uh, uh, round of talks, on an extension of talks. But there had been intensive efforts in the past uh, 24 hours to accompany this extension announcement with something a bit more substantial, which um, it's been phrased maybe as a framework agreement, a political agreement. It's not clear yet how exactly will the extension of talks be announced, but it's very clear now that there were, we're not going to have any very big or historic deals here today, but just, uh, you know, uh, um, let us know that we'll be meeting again in another month or so. And at the talk you also, and the rumors as mentioned here in the studio, is that, you know, there'll be an extension, 60 days, etc. For this to pass, Talgan, correct me if I'm wrong, Obama actually needs to somehow do this before Senate and Congress meet again for this to have any kind of clout. Well, Obama wants to do so before the Senate and Congress meet again, before the beginning of January, in order to have some kind of, uh, to, in order to maintain his waiver and to maintain his uh, ability to uh, um, lift sanctions without uh, really needing to go through Congress. And it, when Congress will reconvene, they can start uh, stumbling blocks on that. 
But nevertheless, the, the sanctions is a big problem even before um, Obama goes to sanction and actually uh, goes to Congress. And actually, that has been the main sticking point here uh, in these past few days. The Iranians have been demanding an immediate lifting of sanctions, uh, while the P5 plus one are saying no such thing, that it will be gradual. And that is actually what, from what we understand from uh, informed sources, that was one of the big problems that actually blew up any chance of reaching a comprehensive deal. Well, Tal Shalev in Vienna will be following this throughout the day for I-24 News. Thank you for being with us this morning. Same to you, Dr. Friedman. Thank you for being with us. After fierce verbal clashes between coalition members, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's administration approved a contentious legislation officially designating Israel as a home of Jewish people. The bill, a proposal for a basic law titled Israel, the nation state of the Jewish people, passed 14 to 6, with two centrist coalition parties opposing it. Now, Parliament, of course, still has to approve the bill for it to become a law, but many in Israel are surprised that it even made it to the coalition's desk. This bill has many problematic aspects, possessing a threat to the coalition and excluding the Israeli Arabs from the Israeli discourse. To further discuss this, we are joined in studio by Haaretz journalist and blogger Uri Misgav. Good morning, Good morning to you. And by advocate Ifa Segal from the Legal Forum of Israel. Good morning to you as well. Good morning. And before we break it down, let's take a look at the following report and take it from there. It was a loud cabinet meeting, to say the least, and no one can say it's a big surprise. In the middle of it all, the proposal for a basic law, Israel as the nation state of the Jewish people, the controversial bill which threatens to tear apart the governing coalition. The cabinet authorized for continuous legislation three versions of the Jewish state bill, which stipulates that while there are equal rights for all, national rights, the right to national self-determination in Israel, belongs solely to the Jewish people. <laughs> People ask, who needs this bill? We have managed 66 years without it. But I ask, who needs the basic law? Human dignity and liberty. We managed 45 years without that. We need both. Israel is a Jewish and democratic state. That may be the bottom line of the discussion, but what preceded the cabinet's approval, shouting, fits banging on tables and personal allegations, will definitely have ramifications. You are proposing legislation which will ruin our democracy. You want a religious state. We wouldn't have gotten to this point if Livni had acted otherwise. If all this nonsense is just to get back at me, then you won. Now let's discuss the essence of the bill before you all ruin the country. Under the cover of the security situation, you're using this highly important issue as a political deal. Is this bill a political deal? If not, postpone the next discussion on it. There's an official opinion of the Attorney General saying it's unconstitutional. A feeble policy does not serve the present reality. Prime Minister, not everyone who disagrees with you is weak. I don't understand the urgency for a law of this kind during such a sensitive period. It is not the time. We are developing a state within a state. The fierce debate is it another indication for the rocky relationship within the government and concrete proof that it's only getting worse. As said, we're joined in studio by our arts journalist and blogger Uri Misgav, and good morning, and by If Segal from the Legal Forum of Israel. Listen, aside from you know the happy music that we just heard, I know it's uh, the happy music we just yeah. heard in that report. I have to say this has been a very, very contentious, incredibly, incredibly devi divisive uh, subject in Israel over the course of the last um, uh, several days. And I mean, we can look at all the headlines this morning. You know, your paper, by the way. Um, let me start with you. Um, there are people in Israel who say that this law is terrifying because it actually it will completely shoot democracy in the leg, um, and I'm sure that you agree. What will this do to the to the society of Israel? The thing is that I don't even know, Yael, should I uh, relate seriously to the answers to the essence of the law. What, what is more terrifying at the moment that it's all election games and deals. The, uh, it's it's maybe a bit complicated to explain to our yeah, viewers, no, a, but I'll try. Please. This bill that was just passed in the government yesterday is not supposed to be approved. Netanyahu himself has a softer version of it. So this was kind of a manipulative uh, revenge attack at, at Livni and Lapid. No, I'm glad you're raising it because the, the lingo of this, um, of this, of, the, of what passed yesterday is actually the hardcore um, uh, um, uh, lingo of the bill 
as presented by members of um, uh, the Jewish House, right? Yes. Um, uh, and, and it actually, you know, it puts, what, what will it do to Arab citizens of this country? If this bill were If pass, this were bill were to pass. This is a game changer. Um, State of Israel wasn't founded on a constitution. We have uh, the declaran Declaration uh, of, of Independence. Independence, and we have this status quo, that the, and we have this expression, which is problematic, Jewish and democratic state. But no one has ever tried to, to make such a right-wing shift uh, into what we have here and try to mix everything now. And this is a very sensitive period of the relations between Arabs and Jews in Israel. This is like a giant mm, elephant in the room. In the, in the not room. in the room, in the table, and in a, in a China store. And in a China store. And, you it's know, a crazy if, idea. If, uh, Advocate Ifa Segal, I <coughs> want to ask you. Um, uh, Minister Livni mm -hmm. and uh, Minister Lapid of the Israeli government have already announced that they're not going to support it, but this did pass yesterday in a very rowdy, you know, discussion. Mm -hmm. You being an advocate also, is, isn't this terrifying? Because in many ways, this says to a large population of Israel, that they're second, it, it quantifies them as second-class citizens if this bill were to pass. I have to tell you the truth. I, I, I, I disagree with you, and I think that if this was the case, then a lot of people would stand up against it. I would stand up against it if this was the case. The, the case is very simple. Today, Israel is a Jewish and democratic country. This is a fact. We all know it. It's written in the Declaration of Independence. We're all treated like that. The world treats it like that. Um, some want to destroy Israel because that's the fact. Some love Israel because that's the fact. It doesn't matter. That's the fact. It was never enacted in a law. It's written in the Declaration of Independence. It's mentioned in several laws, like the basic law of the Knesset, even the human right, uh, the dignity and liberty law. It, it, it's stated in different places, but it was never enacted in a law. Yeah, but this uh, law will quantify who is a Jew in many ways. This, this law says that this is a Jewish and democratic country. It, it says so very clearly that it's both Jewish and democratic. It, democratic. it says that it maintains the rights, uh, equal rights, and, and human rights of every single citizen, of every minority, it respects the traditions. Uh, I, I honestly, if you ask me, I don't see the big change. I think this is a people looking for a reason to fight, people looking to, to, to raise an issue that no one is trying to raise. I'm not, I don't know if no one is trying to raise, but this is not the issue. This is not what's written in the, if you read the explanation of the law as, as it is, uh, even before the softer version of Net read it, it says that it, the, the, the whole idea is to declare Israel as a Jewish enact a law that says Israel is a Jewish country while being democratic. It's equal. We are not the only country in the world that is both, you know, of a national, a certain nationality and, uh, yeah, and but Judaism, democratic. Yeah, you know, in many ways, I think, you know, and uh, correct me I for more. To live here Please, because the, the one world that is not mentioned in this mm -hmm. harder version of the law is equalization. The only thing that there is is personal rights which meaning uh, Arabs and other minorities will have their personal rights. What is personal what rights? What does that mean? No what is personal says. rights? What about the, the rights that are already enacted in basic laws? That we we yes, have basic laws that are very, very, very powerful, and thankfully, that, bill, and that, that protects bill, the, and, the Yeah, the exactly. Rights. And that bill is meant to to outcome them. But that's, no, by the way, that's what that. name is Naftali only, Bennett. Only people, I'm no, sorry. Naftali Bennett is saying that. He, he, he's saying he's, that he wants to violate the yeah, rights. Yeah, he, he sent. That's, he, I don't he, think he that's sent, that's, that's, No, no, I'm just saying. He sent a media, a media announcement yesterday to all the yeah. to all the papers, to all the media devices, saying that with this law, we can start. And, and uh, he, he was talking about the immigrant law. We, we we can start and save the Jewish citizens of Israel from what you from all these other acts and bills that you're talking about. So this is actually taking the balance off. Th that, I don't think that's what he meant, though. What, uh, well, I want to go back to There are several things about, the, about Israel that needs protection. You and I both know it. We all know it. Uh, issues Such of security. Uh, we, we can debate whether what the solution is, but there are issues of security. There are issues of, of, of problems with immigration. There are different issues here. That how does this law, though, then protect, <coughs> you know, security-wise, how does this law protect Israel? Because it quantifies who is a Jew. Because I'm really wondering out loud, what does personal rights mean, the personal bill of rights? And in, in legal um, mm -hmm. language, personal rights, doesn't that open a lot of room for wiggle? you know, that personal rights can be decided later on. I think on. that if we come from a different 
uh, if, if we are completely unaware of what goes on in the, Isra in the Israeli judicial uh, system, uh, and, you, and you come from Mars or something and you land here and you say, oh my God, this law is horrible, maybe you can uh, interpret it like this. But if you look at the Supreme Court here in Israel and every, I don't know if our audience know this, but every citizen in Israel can file a petition if, if your human rights are being violated. And as long as, as there are basic human laws and, and, uh, and, and our high court has always been uh, the safeguard of, the, of these human rights, and that's a very good thing, and it will continue to be. And I don't think anything was ever said, not in the discussions in the Knesset, not the Prime Minister Netanyahu. I, I, again, I say, I don't think that I want it or anyone else wants it to actually violate human rights of other people. This is just about enacting. There are a lot of elements in the world that wants to fight against the, the, the, the, the existence of Israel as a Jewish country. Some people want to en enact it in a law. It, it was not meant to affect human rights, liberty, respect, do you think freedom. That doesn't that pose a danger? First of all, I respect and I respect uh, her view, and uh, I wish she's right. But that's of course not the <laughs> that's not the issue. That's not the meaning of the bill. Otherwise, there won't be no need to pass it. Uh, and the f the hardcore fact is that the the whole the whole system, the whole uh, judicial system, the whole law system is strongly objecting this bill, even. The general advocate, Mr. Yuda Weinstein, which is not known as to be a very, you know, a courageous fighter for human rights, even he said that it's an uh, unbalanced. And so, uh, if it's if it's nothing and there's nothing on the table, no one will put such an effort to to pass it. That's in my logic way I, of thinking. I, I kind of disagree with, uh, disagree with you because uh, people are lo looking for a way to f uh, for reasons to fight sometimes and I think the, the, the reason is there is a lot of like I said before there are a lot of elements in the world that wants to uh, see Israel stop being a Jewish state that wants to change the way Israel is or change the fact that it exists at all so some people feel the need to protect if this is the right way to protect we can argue about that but the, the, the, the but idea where, was where is the protection here to, to enact a law that says the only place, if you look at the Declaration of Independence, it, it says so right there and in other laws, like I said before, but it was never written in any specific law. This is the idea, saying in, in, in the law that this is the fact, that Israel is a Jewish state. The, and, that's, and that makes it undemocratic, because it's either an eth ethnocratic country or democratic well, state. Can't. I mean, the whole, can't have I, I'm wondering the whole idea of, you know, in, in a democracy, the separation of religion and state, which is usually the way it works in a yeah, democracy. Yeah, so you think England is not uh, democratic because church and state is not no, no, separated no, no, there? The, or, no, no, no, but the no. separation of church and state, I'm just Greece asking aloud, if a law is such as passed, and you know, I'm actually quoting, and I can't believe I'm doing this, I'm quoting um, Minister <laughs> Lapid, okay? okay. No, go for it. Yeah, who go said, for it. yeah it's, it's a good quote, who said yesterday okay. that, you know, if a law is such passed, what are you going to say to the family of a person of Officer Zaid Saif? the Druze officer who got killed in the line of duty protecting a synagogue in Jerusalem that was being attacked by terrorists, okay? How do you explain to the family of Zaid Saif, okay, mm -hmm. that they are second-class citizens as, as cash aid in a law that was passed because he's not really, he's not a full part of the Jewish state? Listen, but the reality is not changed. Today, Israel, we haven't enacted any laws or anything else. But Today it's on also, the table. It's on the, it was on the table always. We were always a Jewish country. It was, it was just not written in a specific law. We were always a Jewish and democratic country. It was always the fact. Yeah, and this officer is a hero. And we, I think, a vast because majority. He's dead. No, because he's someone who's go, who goes and does something heroic. But by this makes law, he's officially a second-hand citizen. citizen. It, it, it doesn't change his status a first, from He's a first-hand hero. You're looking hero, to make things a lot more... Why? Why are you looking to do this? Uh, is is Israel a, a Jewish country? Today, today. Are we a Jewish country? No. It shouldn't. It, it's We're a, not it's a Jewish country? It's a country of, of, a, of a, a majority Jewish people and of 20% Arabs, Jews, and Bedouins. But, but the, uh, by the way, the, look, I, look at the coalition agreement. Look at the coalition agreement itself that was signed with uh, Benjamin Netanyahu and Livni mm -hmm. and Yair Lapid. It says so, first uh, section of the coalition agreement uh, guidelines, it says uh, the government will act to protect the fact that this is, this is a Jewish country, that we're protecting the heritage and the history and the fact that this is a Jewish but, country. And, and again, it says so right asking, there, what what's the difference? Mean, yeah, but what does that mean if in that law, as you said, you know, basic rights or, you know, what was it, personal rights? Or personal what, rights. Personal rights are mm -hmm. protected. But Israel as a Jewish state takes, you know, actually precedent. 
Nobody can really explain what that means in practice if this were to pass. But it's but people, even the people who suggested this legislation, Ayala Chaked and Yariv Levin, right? Yeah, which uh, is the, extreme right wing. Is, uh, is in prominent. your opinion, that's that's okay. That that's your opinion. But the word no, extreme right everywhere. Right. No, but, but they it's are they opinion. are right. No, but it's to extreme put extreme right uh, next to everything okay. doesn't make it extreme. It just makes it a rhetoric, a way of rhetoric. So Ayala Chaked says uh, says that there. there there is a basic law that that uh, you know anchors the fact that this is a democratic country. There is no basic law that anchors the fact that it's a Jewish country. She said she was the one who suggested the legislation that this is what she's trying to do. It's equal status of both Jewish and democratic. And so why are you putting words in in these people's mouths? No, no, but, but hold on. No, we we I actually just, I can give two good examples. Two good of examples, this bill, you know, of it, this act. It, first of all, it, it declares officially that the only official language in Israel is Hebrew. So far, it used to be Hebrew and Arabic. And Arabic. And the second example. Um, I just slipped my mind, but I had a good one. There's another uh, major, ch ah, yeah, that the Israeli uh, law system will take direct and general inspiration from the Bible law system, okay? This is 2014 here. We know what republics and countries take inspiration from, from biblical laws, from biblical but and laws. you know, and this, this is something that was already. Uh, one second, we do have Ayala Chaked on the phone just now, joining us um, uh, from Jerusalem. Um, uh, minister Chaked um, is not a minister. So, sorry, exactly. an Israeli Parliament member. Sorry, Israeli Parliament. Ayala Chaked, good morning to you. Good morning. Now you are one of the instrumental forces with uh, um, behind this bill. Already this morning, um, uh, Minister Lapid and Minister Livni have announced flat out a few minutes ago that they will not support this. What, you know, is this not actually a bill that at this point is playing into the hands of political games leading into election? What's the point of even putting it on the table? It's only political. There's nothing really, uh, uh, there's no really issue here. All the parties agree that Israel is a democratic and Jewish state. We agree on 14 points that uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu put on the table. Most of them are already exist in the law that myself and uh, Yariv Levin suggest. It's only a pre uh omit. It's only the first vote um, that uh, we are going to do. After the vote, there will be a debate, a deep debate in the Knesset about exactly how to phrase the law. Yeah, but, but so you... it's only a real, it's only a political fight. All the parties know all the parties know it. Uh, Livni and myself sat for four months uh, to try and find uh, the right phrase that everyone agrees on. And the points that Benjamin Netanyahu put and uh, that most of them are in my deal actually are the the, the consensus. At least I mean so I... it's really Political issue. But still, it's on the table, and I think you know the danger is always when something is put on the table that it'll pass, regardless of the political fight. Really quickly, we have Aliza Lavi of Yeshati, that's the party actually um, uh, trying to oppose this. Aliza, is your party going to actually oppose this bill so much so that it's not going to vote on Wednesday? Good morning. No, good morning to you. Lapid um, uh, announced this morning that he's not going to support this bill. Does that mean the coalition is breaking up? It's not a question of breaking up. It's a question of why now nation-state law is coming. Yes, it did. will support a nation-state law, but only one which uh, interests Israel as a Jewish state and protects the democratic nature uh, of the country. We're talking about equal democratic and Jewish state, and including the rights of right. all minorities. Let's speak about minorities here in Israel, Arabic, Muslims. I know, uh, and it's even, sadly, uh, sadly, sadly, I'm, uh, Dr. Aliza Lavie, that's all the time we have, but thank you for being with us. We'll go to the news and we'll be right back. It's I-24 News, Morning Edition, November... Uh, 24th. Thank you. Oh, yes. Wait, tomorrow's Thanksgiving? 
Oh, no, it's always it's the, the last Thursday, the last of, Thursday the of the month. Yeah. Thank you. Americans right here. According to tradition. <laughs> <laughs> and we say hello and good morning to Anthony Grant, who joins me daily to discuss the news you missed while scanning the headlines. Yes. What did I miss? Well, you know, there's a lot of uh, headlines out there that are as heavy as those clouds behind you. <sighs> so that is one. Poetry. Gonna, yeah, yes. well, I'm going to start with something light, though, Please. and important uh, from Tunisia. A great headline in Le Monde, uh, which loosely translated says she's... 80 years old and she never voted for a president before in her life basically and this is regarding the elections that started off uh, and unrolled very peacefully and quietly in Tunisia uh, for the most part yesterday um, and this is a big deal in the country That's a huge where deal. I mean the one thing that I that I think is great as as we discussed um, uh, several times is that it's the one place where the Arab Spring has sprung yeah, I mean, in many it's, ways, it's, it's working. It's uh, yeah. it does appear to be, you know, at its own rhythm. But uh, you know, it uh, definitely is something that is, uh, you could say, an example for a lot of countries in not just the region but yeah, the no, world. No, no. And it's, <laughs> exactly. Uh, yeah, globally. It looks globally. like there's going to be a runoff between the two uh, major uh, um, contenders there. And uh, although they say that uh, um, Sebsi, who was the guy with the secularist party there, which is called Tunisia's right. call in, in English is probably going to clinch it, but not sure yet. But it's and just too soon to tell. And the, the, the beauty, and, the, and, and if you're speaking about poetry this morning, the beauty of an 80-year-old woman who spent her years under, yeah. you know, rule of, you know, be, I don't want to say dictatorships, or, you know, um, you know that Ben Ali was a the dictator. Ben Ali was a yeah. dictator, yes, I can say <laughs> I that. I mean, a, a some, somewhat benevolent one, <laughs> but somewhat <laughs> but still, not, I don't know. But she gets to vote is, yeah. is beautiful. Yeah, so that's good stuff. Oh. Um, speaking of shifting to the other uh, the section of the African continent in Egypt, um, the Jerusalem Post was very fast to report on some remarks that uh, President Sisi made to uh, Italian newspaper Corriere della Sera, saying that Egypt would send troops to a future Palestinian state if all parties would agree. Agree. And this is um, kind of a big deal for That's him huge. to come out and say yeah. that. <laughs> Uh, to do what? Basically, he's talking about uh, that Egypt would be prepared to send military forces. He's kind of speaking more specifically uh, to uh, Gaza, I which, bet, of course, yeah. Egypt ruled up until 1967. So and they it's know on the territory. The border yeah. within the whole, you know, that point in contention. And he's yeah, saying to, to help local police and to reassure Israelis in the role as guarantor. So it's interesting <laughs> stuff coming from him ahead of uh, a lot of uh, no, travel. No, it, it's very interesting. And, you know, I think that's something that most likely Hamas and, you know, would never agree to. Maybe not Hamas. But maybe the Palestinian Authority would look at it. You yeah, know, it's with a, more actually, you know what? It's interesting you mentioned it because we sat on Friday. We spoke with the UN, uh, sorry, the EU, the European Union's ambassador in Israel. So one of the sticking points in Gaza is that Hamas doesn't want to allow Fatah policemen right. into Gaza. And maybe these are things behind the scenes. Mm. Who knows? What's the arising? <clears throat> yeah, but whatever CC says, it's interesting too, and, and important, I think, to, to hear what he has to Definitely. say. Um, let's talk for a second about Afghanistan. Um, <clears throat> Yes. Well, Afghanistan is, is in the headlines for a lot of bad reasons. Just to, We have here a, an interesting headline. Afghanistan's parliament has backed a U.S. troops deal to basically uh, allow U the U.S. and NATO to keep uh, actually t upwards of 12,000 troops in Afghanistan next year to support local forces. Now, this is coming on the heels of Obama's agreeing that the U.S. Mm. military leaders could basically approve combat operations. He, he put that kind of through earlier this month. Now the Afghan parliament is basically... I don't want to say rubber stamped it, but they've they okayed rubbers, it. Yeah, no, you, you, you, I think yeah. you're, you put it very, very um, you know, in, in the right words. So and actually, and I, I read about the U.S. troops, about the U.S. Um, uh, commanding um, uh, yeah. uh, commanders in in Afghanistan. Well, I mean, they're, they've got a big free hand to allow U.S. troops to go on special ops, right? Counterterrorism operations, operations um, to assist local Loma. assist local forces, and also it basically means to help, still help uh, combat the Taliban. Because again, we have, um, you know, of course, just yesterday there were the uh, the reports of the uh, this massive attack at a volleyball 13 match. Thirteen years on. Uh, yeah. yeah. So <laughs> people are getting on, guilt, yeah. killed, you know, right and left there. Uh, so that's why you kind of, you, I think you see the um, the back, the easy back and forth between the Afghan go government and the United I think States. They have here. to, but the frightening thing about it, you know, there are those who will argue um, uh, that you know when you have a foreign tr a foreign force of an uh, army in a country. Yeah. Allowing be, allowing it to operate is you know spells some very wrong things to the people of the country. That it it does yeah. beg those questions. Um, yeah, but, but again, it, just I want to say mention here in the New York Times headline, which 
underscoring some of the, the reasoning for what's going on here, I think, it basically says an hour's drive outside of Kabul, the Taliban reign. So, ah. you know, you have headlines like this, which yes. are hitting policymakers early in the morning. And so, again, uh, if, if, to what you said, of course, that raises questions no, domestically in Afghanistan, and, and, and but we internationally. Look at, as you said, if you, you put that New York Times headline 13 years on, what was it, 2001, right after 9 11? Uh, very soon after, yeah. Very soon after that the United States um, uh, got into Afghanistan. Still there, Taliban still reigning. Yeah. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, and in other parts of the world, we have other acts of, uh, of course, uh, brutality of uh, the nation which is a big paper in Kenya is following every aspect of what happened over the weekend um, in um, the northern part of the country uh, where Al-Shabaab basically executed something like uh, tw actually only killed 28 people after they hijacked a bus and apparently singled out those who could not recite verses of the Koran. Now, a survivor says that the gunman you know, fired in jubilation after this, uh, what they're calling the Mandera execution. Very bad stuff. What prompted it apparently was that um, prior to that, uh, Kenya security forces had been uh, carrying out raids against mosques in the port city of Mombasa. Yeah. The Al-Shabaab was kind of based in Somalia, but they're trying to basically extend their tentacles into Kenya. And this is very bad news for Kenya, which is like an economic uh, and tourism oh, linchpin yeah. of this portion of Africa. And so there's a lot of blame game going on in the government of Kenya. That people are saying that maybe the security threats haven't been taken seriously enough. And I think that's going to start to change uh, right after One this would attack. Hope. I mean, this, yeah. this sounds like a massacre. Of it's a, a massacre. massacre. There's no other way. Uh, teachers, 17 teachers were killed, healthcare workers. Um, Kenyan military retaliated almost immediately with airstrikes against an Al-Shabaab ca camp in Somalia, killing 45 rebels. <sighs> it's just not looking too no, uh, no. Uh, yeah. calm there at the moment. Um, Happy it, Monday. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Haaretz reports that uh, the U.S. is going to be arming Iraqi Sunni tribesmen in the fight against ISIS. Um, the U.S. will be funding AK-47s, RPGs, and mortar rounds to help bolster yeah. the fight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah. Know, so this is, yeah. Uh, no, just, this is what the Sunni tribesmen look like. Compared to ISIS, yeah, you know, yeah, they are you fighting can't, with the, Can't get with away from the, it. The, the, yeah, no, no, no, all no. the weapons from Iraq. They have the best weapon because the American. It's American it's weapon. It's American actually. weaponry. No, yeah, that's so what I was doing. It's going weapon. through the uh, going yeah. through the mill there and into their hands. Now so. let's uh, let's shift more. Um, uh, yeah, <clears throat> more. But that said, you know, we did have the first of all, um, um, uh, Dali Berko from the IDC who was joining, who was here for mm. the for the next segment. But from looking at these headlines, you know, Tony, and I'm thinking. The Peshmerga fighters are saying they don't have enough, you know, weaponry. Weapons are being sent to yeah. Sunni sectarian. Yeah, I mean, there's oh. a bigger request facing Congress to give more funding to the Peshmerga. So the Peshmerga, again, this yeah. is this what that headline is just one part and of, of the whole picture. Of course, people in the region here, I, I'm going, I'm shaking my head, thinking, yes, let's send more weapons into the sectarian violence. Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah. some people <clears throat> think it's a good thing. Um, other mm -hmm. people are shelling out money to dine with royalty. On a different note. Finally. Um, yeah, yeah. Kate and William, uh, a Duke and Duchess of Cambridge, are heading to New York next month. And uh, there's a big dinner at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, and a table for 10 costs $100,000. New York socialites are beating each other back to get a to seat get at the table. At the yeah, to dine with uh, Kate and William. I'm going to quote my, fa my late father, who said, you know, even royalty goes to the bathroom. Why are people they so do, But they do it more elegantly than the rest of us. <laughs> <So>. More pajamas. <laughs> more pajamas. Yeah, so they're wow. going to be tearing up the headlines Sexy. there. Pretty soon. Yeah. Tony, Tony, yeah. Okay, I'm, mm. that's terrifying to me. Yeah. Tony, stick around. Next hour coming up, but also the next item, very f fascinating and terrifying, which you're you're good at. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. I said, of course, ISIS can never be away from the news too much, and we move to our next topic: the Islamic State. It's gotten us used, quote unquote, to see horrific beheading videos released every now and then. But this time, it seems like evil has overcome itself. The video, released by the militant group, shows how foreigners are assimilated into the Islamic State. And in this case, it's a group of Kazakh men, women, and children. The video, which appeared briefly on YouTube before it was removed by the site, starts by showing a group of Kazakh men training for combat. But the majority of the footage focuses on kids, some younger even than three years old. This is not easy stuff to watch. To discuss it, we are joined in studio by Dr. Lieutenant Colonel on Reserve Anat Berko from the IDC, the Interdisciplinary Center in Herzliya. Thank you and good morning to you and thank good you for morning, being yeah. here. Let's take a look at this clip. As said before, this is not easy to watch and take it from there. 
الدروس العلمية من قرآن وتجويد ولغة عربية وهم إن شاء الله ينطلقون إلى التدريب البدني والعسكري حتى يكبروا بإذن الله ويدركوا عروش الطوارئ فهم بإذن الله هؤلاء هم هم الجيل القادم هؤلاء هم من سيزعزعون الأرض ومن سينشرون بإذن الله الدين القيم في جميع الأرض جيش كالأسود وجيش في العراق لو احتدى أعطينا مسين عبد الله عبد الله كيف تنقلنا؟ Kazakhstan. Mashallah. Kaç yıl desin sen? İslam Halifat. Mashallah. Ne istiyor atsın? Muhaskır ve Nadir. Mashallah. Amirin kim sen? Abu Bakır Bağdadi. Mashallah. Özkesin kim bulasın sen? Ben özkesin inşallah kafirler sindirdi. Bağızlaydı mücahit bulam. Mashallah. Arapski yürenemiz. Arap dilini yürenemiz. Tacvid yürenemiz. Fih yürenemiz. Olsun mükülü Allah için yürenemiz atırmız. İnşallah. Biz muaskır yürüyenin uzatırız. Sinderde inşallah, olsa sinder kafirlerde ultremiz biz inşallah. Bağızdayımız. Takbir! Allah! Allah! Allah! Allah! Yeah, no, Dr. Berger, I, you know, I'm, I'm looking at this video, and I, I think we can only theorize on how much of, you know, the production of IS videos is manipulated, who knows. But when you see that, and you know, and you, that's part of form of your expertise, the integration of children into groups as such. First of all, is there even a chance after something like this, if this is true, if this is something that, you know, clearly is happening or supposedly is happening, how do you then change, you know, the feelings, the, uh, you know, the, the animosities of children as such when, when you teach them something like this so early on? Actually, it's very similar to what is going on in the Hamas kindergartens. And summer camps, it looks the same. Young children shooting, getting military training, putting uniform with the bandana of the Shahada, the same thing, and sometimes even have, uh, you know, it's like blood, but it's, uh, it's color, okay. red color on their hands, and they are dancing like this. So, uh, you know, children are very vulnerable to this phenomenon because many times they feel like they need to protect their own family and if they join those group they can be safer the other thing they think that they can gain honor and um, to add honor to the family masculinity especially yeah. for the boys especially teens and the other thing that um, they track the media women and children are the smarter bomb. They track the media, they can give the camouflage if they are uh, going to carry out a terror attack and they have children inside the car, a child or a woman, it's the cover of the family. Nobody suspects that it's, uh, they're going to blow the car up with the child inside. And we saw those pictures also in Iran. But not only that, they attract the media in a way that this, right now, you know, this is almost public relations. When we look at something like that, right, it's totally correct. When we see that, I mean, the first reaction is shock. It's, it's, it's horrifying, it's shock. But, you know, we take notice, right? We take sure, notice. This, yeah. is, this is the whole thing. <laughs> yeah. This is the whole thing. Uh, actually, I define this phenomenon for children as to be a shahid or not to be. It's like... You are something if you play even outside in the streets with your face concealed and you join the Shabab, the guys, and you, they are the role models. You feel that you're worth something. And many times those children, especially elementary school, and because they are in um, um, war zones, right. conflict zones, they don't have any chance to, to achieve, to fulfill in school, and they have very poor performing, performings. So sometimes this is another direction to get the admiration of the society and other people. And the parents are against it. You know, we there. feel like that all oh, the Muslim parents very happy and serve sweets after their child blow themselves Do they up. actually have a choice? That's, yes. Yeah, that's my question. They don't really have they a choice, They don't do have they? the choice. Yeah. They right. don't have, they, start with these kids they exploit them. them. Yeah, I mean, when it comes to the, uh, the Kazakhs, the, the, these Kazakhstan. children, for example, in Kazakhstan, when we look at these children, what do we know about how IS is, is using they kids? They're kidnapping children. It's yeah. okay. they, they actually, and sometimes from even the, from Iraq, Araka, when they decided that Araka will be the start of the caliphate, a zone that they started to work, they take children from their houses 
and they join them, indoctrinate them, educate them from very early age, that after that, this is the path that for them, and they cannot actually uh, choose to, to go to another no, it's direction. It's like the, those are, three, are the four, perfect soldiers. They're very susceptible to anything, any type of them, uh, thing. Very that obedient to the, the adults. And yeah. for them, they are, he is the man. He is the guy who can provide for me economically, to improve my status, the status of my family. Culturally, they feel like they are part of something big. And right. they feel, and they give them a sense of belonging and that worth knows. something. Um, again, you know, shedding a light on this um, uh, horrific, um, uh, on this horrific phenomenon. But still, um, uh, Dr. Parker, thank you for being with, uh, for being here with us. Some um, uh, ter terrifying visuals to see, and as we said, you know, an IS video released over over the course of the last week. Thank you for being with us. When we get back, something different, a little lighter. Tune in to Tel Aviv 2014. It's a music festival that introduces local talents to key figures in the music industry from around the world. We'll take a closer look, see who succeeded first, though. Let's go to the news. Welcome back. It is still Monday, November 24th, 2014. This is still the morning edition. I am still Yael V. Thank God for that. And thank you for staying with us. American music industry icon Seymour Stein was the keynote speaker at Tune in Tel Aviv, an annual music industry conference, and showcased the tip place in the past few days in the Israeli city by the sea, very tumultuous sea behind me. So to hear more about the new local talents and the whole festival, we're joined in studio by the CEO and managing director of Olay Records, Jeremy Halsh. Yes, I'm, pronoun I... I'm pronouncing your name right, right? That's correct, okay. sure. And also with us, Grammy-nominated producer, um, you're killing me with this, Firstborn, like Jesus. <laughs> not quite. <laughs> Good. Firstborn, first of all, I have to because, you know, I've been getting texts, just so you know, before we enter the studio, that you are actually also in the works right now doing the next album with Rihanna. Oh, I'm working, I'm, I'm one of many producers working on the record. Um, been working on a couple of the albums, man. Right. I'm just excited and we'll, we'll see what happens. We'll touch on that in a second because Tony Grant, of course, is here too and he's part of her Navy, just okay. so you know. I am. Yes. Yes. <laughs> she has a very big navy. Yes. Yes. Yes. I short the Middle really? Eastern yeah. quadrant. Oh, exactly, he's the Middle yeah. Eastern quadrant. But I want to start, oh, first of all, you know, Jeremy, let's start with you. Sure. Tell me about this festival because I think it's it's something that actually gives a huge chance to many local artists. Correct? Sure, yeah, yeah. Um, so we created Tune Tel Aviv about four years ago as an international showcase platform where we essentially deliver some of the most influential industry veterans and media from around the world to take a look at, fall in love with, and then invest in uh, local talent. Um, this year, we brought in over 30 international delegates. Uh, we showcased around 40 acts in over nine venues. Uh, we had thousands of fans come out and support the scene. And um, already I'm hearing of deals that were uh, being done between our international guests and local talent. Uh, you know, some of the guests that came out this year were uh, Zigit Festival, uh, Lollapalooza, Banaru, uh, uh, um, Midi. This is a huge chance, actually, for people. It's huge, yeah. you know, because the the scene here is small and vital, and they but they they don't have the kind of relationships that they they need or the exposure that they need, and that's where my organization comes in. We we try to make uh, with whatever we can, because again, we are a nonprofit. Um, you know, a very valuable contribution to um, you know the local music sector. No, no, definitely, and. Uh, and firstborn, I just love saying this. <laughs> <laughs> you, this is your first time in Israel. It is. What do you think about the music scene? Man, I love it. I, I, I, I was asked several questions on what I thought about Israel and what I thought about everything, and it's it's a very feeling place. You know what I'm saying? You have mm. a lot of people who wear their emotions on their sleeve, Don't whether the, whether ever. whether the emotions are great or sad or bad or whatever. Um, and we're that, in your face. Yeah, and <laughs> yeah. but it translates in the music. It translates in the music, and for music, you know. Emotion is everything. It's the currency of music. So I, I was very impressed, um, very moved by a lot of the artists, and I can remember a lot of the things that I saw and heard and felt, man. Do you feel I, that the enjoyed. music, as you, it's a beautiful point of making that it interlaces and that type of in your face, some, uh, you know, mentality, which, by the way, you know, people usually hate about us, so I like that you like it. Um, but does does it feel? How do you feel it in the music? And do you, do you see anybody that really, you know, drive you in a way that you're thinking? 
you know. Oh yeah, there's a. It, it's funny because my family's originally from Jamaica, so that's why yeah. I can I can yeah, relate. Yeah, you can to relate. It. Yeah. yeah. Um. But yeah, there were several brands, you know, thanks to Jeremy and Olay, that you know they they bridge the gap between you know things I may never hear, you know what I mean, and opportunities these artists may never get, and they bridge the gap for us to you know, be in an interaction with each other. It, it, it was just very moving to see artists very passionate about what they're doing, you know, and, and they see Israel and they see, you know, things on television. They're like, how can I get wh from where I am in this small country to where I want to be in front of the world? And it's it's these relationships and this bridging of, of, of a gap that, you know, that, that makes that, that possible. That. Yeah. And Jeremy, I'm wondering with you, what? how did this come about four years ago? What was the idea behind it? Because, I mean, sure. in many countries around the world, everybody, a singer will dream to go, you know, and make it all the way, and obviously sure. the place is the United States. Yeah, um, well, uh, actually, Olay's been around for uh, over nine years now, uh, and we've been delivering Israeli talent to showcase events and festivals abroad um, all, all along. Uh, it got to a point where, you know, we were servicing so many talents, and, you know, every country now has their own industry event in, in uh, France you have Mama Paris which is their big industry event South by Southwest of course which is the biggest we deliver artists to both those and dozens more uh, the idea was you know to try to not only bring artists abroad but also bring the people the decision makers the influencers here to, to not just see a band but to taste smell touch feel you know the scene and that's what they did um, you know everyone walked away with a totally different perspective of uh, the music scene here, and that's really what this is about. Uh, music export, which is essentially... Come see the culture and the music, not just the war. Is yeah, well, ways. again, I, we're, we're an apolitical organization entirely, um, and, uh, you know, our focus is really about the music. Obviously, there is a certain cachet of uh, influence that we, we have when it, when it comes to showing people a different side yeah. of Israel. Um, we have a lot of challenges here, but you know, I think our biggest challenge is the fact that there's just so much talent uh, and not enough places to... I like to, to hear that, because yeah. I, I have to say this to both of you, also you firstborn, I love saying that, <laughs> um, but the, you know, I had a friend in New York who yeah. once said to me, he was actually the music writer at the time, many moons ago of the New York Times, and he said to me, you know, I don't think there's any, the rock and, and, and music cannot be anything else but in English. <laughs> I mean, clearly you guys don't feel the same. Is there room, though, for Israeli music, do you think, in the international music scene? I, th I definitely think so. I, I think the international music scene is all about new music and great music. And uh, I was telling a couple of artists, they were like, you know, how can, how can we do this? How can we how do can that? How can we translate? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's about innovation. It's about being who you are from where you're from and being that at the best of your ability. And people can relate to any emotion. We're all related in that, in that sense. And so if you can communicate that emotion from a real place, people want to hear it. You know, similar things people are going through here in Israel, they're going through in the States, or they're going through in Australia, or they're going yeah. through in China, they're going through in Japan, you know, and in India. It's, it, we're, we're a smaller community of humans than we realize, you know, and it, I think Israel is just another place like that they can communicate for the world. Well, an optimistic item. That doesn't happen to me every morning. <laughs> <laughs> um, but Jeremy, and really quickly to you, Jeremy, I'm wondering in terms of, you know, has uh, in this specific, uh, this specific um, uh, uh, round of Tune in Tel Aviv, are there any, like, artists that stood out that you think, you know, connections have been made? Sure. Um, I'd say... You know, I can name a few acts that just a lot of people yeah. were talking about. Alone Landa, a collective, Garden oh, City yeah. Movement, uh, a prodigy young guy named uh, Tamir Grinberg. He, you know, Seymour Stein was definitely interested in, in uh, what Tamir has to, uh, to offer. Um, and and the, the other thing I just want to point out is, you know, in terms of whether or not Israeli artists can succeed on an international stage, that's already happening. It's just not happening at scale. You know, I want to do what uh, Bjork did for Iceland, what Abba did for Sweden. We have the talent here. Um, we just need to uh, be able to brand it, communicate it, market it, and deliver it, uh, you know, in, uh, in, in a much uh, more significant way. And that's what I'm trying to do with Tune in Tel Aviv. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very much impressed. And first of all, really, you know, Quickly, how have you tasted the local foods? Have you had some hummus already? Oh man! <laughs> well, you're gonna laugh. I don't personally prefer hummus, but every every everything <laughs> that I've had here has been awesome. Isn't it? It's oh, been yeah. awesome. It's been awesome. Like I don't the have food enough. Tastes I, like fruit. Yeah, I don't have enough, you know, styrofoam boxes to take all the food that I want home. <laughs> there you go. Some. 
Man, yeah, exactly. please, please. <laughs> exactly. And, you know, speaking of which, you guys are locked in the studio. We have another item coming up, but we kind of locked you in. Because sure. this is um, this is Tony Grant with the spiral viral that oh, is yeah. the web review, also of Rihanna's, Rihanna's um, Navy. Navy, yes. yes. Um, I actually have accepted my first shipment of Rogue Man, the fragrance for Rihanna by men. Oh. <laughs> I mean, for men by Rihanna. <laughs> See, I'm t turned around. It's Clearly, we do Navy. very serious news. Yeah, yeah. So, in this um, part of the show. Yes. Yeah. Anyway, um, speaking of pop music, pop stars, getting right into it, um, Katy Perry, who I think has more Twitter followers than God. Or uh, the Pope. Or the Pope. <laughs> um, <laughs> she has slammed, slammed the so-called perverted and disgusting Australian paparazzi for stalking her as she was making her way to the beach. Uh, she's a part of her prismatic tour there in Australia. And she, she sort of tweeted this, uh, it's like a very lengthy screed against how, against the paparazzi in general. And it just, it makes you wonder. Woman, you're a celeb, get yeah, used to it. Yeah, I mean, the yeah. thing is, she's kind of courting the, the, the paparazzi just by dint of being Katy Perry, but she has, she wants her private time, her downtime. So you gotta say, you know, I don't know. You know, Twitter yeah, flap. Crime your river. Mm. Um, anyway, yeah, so that's my transition to the pop stars. But speaking, speaking of, of. Um, of perverted and dangerous, it brings us right to Adolf Hitler. And <laughs> we cannot. Good morning, all. Good morning. <laughs> Bokertov, uh, good yeah. morning. Yes, what about Adolf? Uh, uh, Hitler as the artist, as a young man. His, <gasps> yes, his, we forget. We yeah. forget, but <laughs> someone at an auction over the weekend slammed down something like 130,000 euros for a painting by Adolf called Civil Registry Office in the Old Town Hall of Munich. Now, not a Van Gogh. <laughs> Yeah. Not a Van Gogh. So this was um, an auction. Uh, I think it was somewhere. I don't know where it was. But guess who the buyer was? An unidentified individual from the Middle East. Oh. Yeah. Hmm. Mm. <laughs> yes. I don't know if it's going to rise up in some IS video. Next I don't know. But can you imagine having that on your living room wall? And what do you tell people when they come in? Yes, this is by Adolf Hitler. Yeah, I mean, yeah come it's, on. it's just, yeah, yeah. Uh, you yeah. know, you know it, it, Hitler actually painted 2,000 um, paintings between 1905 and 1920. No, but it's the old God, joke. But, you know, it's like he, he wasn't very successful. It was like, oh, okay, so I'm just going to kill everybody. politics. Yeah, and then, there you go. Yeah, all the rest okay. of it. So interesting news <laughs> on the art sitting front. sitting in the studio like this. <laughs> We have no idea where we just arrived. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yes. Well, remember the Wizard of Oz. Of course. Yes. Yes, there's um, no place like home. There's no place like home, and the Cowardly Lion costume is up for oh. auction starting today, I oh. believe, in New York. Yeah, um, of course, um, that's something that is Lions a and lot tigers of, and bears. Oh, oh my. my. Yeah. <laughs> now, you know who played the Cowardly Lion back in that? We do? Joe Biden. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. No, it was Ask. it was Bert Bert Lahr. It was Bert Lahr, who may or may not have been Jewish. Um, anyway, so um, that can be a yours. Big question every morning here. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah, um, amazing stuff there in Oxford. I would buy it. I would buy it. Yeah. And actually, I'd go for the Keep Tin Man. I got to tell you. Oh, the Tin Man. The tin man. Yeah, yeah, that was the coolest that was one, the coolest wasn't it? One, the tin yeah. Man. And of course, and I'm a chick, so I want the shoes also. Yeah, I want the Toto. Red shoes. Yeah, you want Toto. Take Toto. Okay. Anyway, right. um, the British we talked about are coming to uh, New York in December. Kate and William. There's a dress code. The Buckingham Palace has said that journalists can't wear blue jeans if they want to cover the um, the royals doing yeah. their thing. Yeah. yeah. So it's a little bit. Um, yes. Journalists have taken to Twitter to say, "Hey, um, the royal family is trying to tell the American press how to dress. Isn't this what the Revolution was for. Yes. If, no, if I were a journalist, if I was a journalist still based in New York, I'd, I'd be going over there with little tea bags. You know, just throwing them at them. Yeah. Call the tea baggers. No, this is very interesting stuff, though, because, you know, is is anyone going to actually pay attention to this in the U.S.? I mean, they also say technicians yeah, can't wear question. jeans. Yeah, that, that would be a problem. Yeah. That would, but it's very, I, I don't know. I think, you know, I think, they, I think Americans, correct me if I'm wrong, I was sort of in, in love with anything royal from the UK that they'll probably that they'll you know, follow suit. Um, I don't know. No, you're, okay. yeah. you're like, I don't care. I don't okay. care. Yeah. <laughs> and, okay. yes. uh, of course, um, the Bill Cosby scandal wow. is continuing, making the front page of newspapers like the Daily News. <laughs> now some guy used to work with, at NBC, Frank Scotty, says he paid off Cosby's girls with payments of $2,000 here and there. Didn't realize at the time that he was covering up some perhaps you know, untoward shenanigans. Uh, this is just, her I mean, the sad thing about this story is, is, you know, the amount of, you know, if true, I'm glad it's coming out, but A, I don't know now of any woman in the States who wasn't harassed by Bill Cosby. Mm. That's what it feels like. <laughs> yeah, you know, well, I mean, seriously. I, I was waiting for Lisa Bonet to say something. 
Hmm. You know, who was my favorite on the Cosby Show. And your favorite, too. She was everybody's favorite. Yeah. Yeah. She gave a very mysterious tweet in which she alluded to karma. Oh, God. Yes. And then she deleted her Twitter account. So... She, uh, I don't know if you have a picture of the tweet, but it's people are saying, hmm, mm, it's what you say. Karma, what you do. and then gone. Like, karma catches nice. up with you, and then she disappeared from How the Twitterverse. How the mighty have fallen, seriously. Yeah, it's so sad. interesting. It's not done with that. Um, and? Valerie Trierweiler, the former esteemed first... First First lady. unofficial first, uh, first lady. First girlfriend. First girlfriend first of girlfriend France of for France. a while, um, has um, dished to the BBC about her personal drama, and I love the headline, because she's not dishing to take down Francois Hollande, but she wants to build herself up. <laughs> she wants to it's reconstruire. Me. I'm going to bitch about him, yeah. but this is for me. <laughs> Very elegantly. And you know, <laughs> so. I, I, I got handed to her. I think that she has taken the high road here. Really? Like, yeah. Which yeah. is kind of like I've been cheating on I'll, I'll tell. Well, you know, she's trying to give, like, to contextualize it. But anyway, I advise everyone to watch the interview. Um, in the meantime, um, quickly, we have to say Kim Kardashian has supported her child Northwest posing nude someday. Okay, so <laughs> not now. Because I have not lived in the States for so long yet. <laughs> I'm just yeah. like, why is this woman? <laughs> now why she, is she? Why is why? she? In the, yeah. Yeah. Because, why is she a celebrity? Because I, um, because she. Because one day her child will will yeah, will. Not yeah. now, but one day. But you know who is posing nude as we speak? Really Winnie, quickly. Winnie the Pooh. Yeah, he's been banned Winnie from a Polish town because apparently he has questionable genitalia. <laughs> <laughs> Or lack thereof. Why would he, he, the he wear a half Barbie onesies? And Ken. Yeah, been I know exactly. I know Barbie, Barbie and Ken. Ken. With all due respect, yeah. have we ever seen their genitalia? Look at, <laughs> no, we don't want to. No, look at who lives. You know, come yeah, on. Yeah, come on, Poland. So, the, the, Poland. Po -po -po Poland. Po Poland. Po -po Poland. Yeah. Tony Grant, fabulous having you with me every morning. Thank you, Thank you for the Winnie the Pooh genitalia. When we get back, sports, ladies and gentlemen, stick with us first. Though the news. Thank you for staying with us on this rainy Monday, Monday. Um, we are joined in studio. Actually, we have two fabulous people here. Our feminist expert, women aficionado, I-24 News editor, Karen Kier. She'll bring us anything and everything important on female, women, gender, agenda. And then we have Jonathan Reggett. Am I fabulous people, too? <laughs> I'm under we'll look, the category of fabulous, fabulous people. Fabulous people. I don't uh, that's what he wants see. to know. Wanted to make yeah, sure. Exactly. <laughs> All the rest doesn't matter. Then it's uh, fine. I'm fabulous people. I've, You're fabulous I've people. got what I wanted for today. It's you. fabulous people Good morning. Good thing I woke up this morning. I know. We're still, we're still <laughs> trying, some of us. Karen, what do you have for us today? So, um, last week, there was an interesting conference of a project that, for full disclosure, I have to say I used to work for, <laughs> <laughs> to promote equal pay in Israel. Yeah. And uh, I actually went there and did a bit of a story about it, so maybe nice. we can watch yeah, it. Let's take a look. Equal pay. Mm -hmm. An Israeli woman needs to work additional three months to reach the annual compensation of a man in the same job. And Israel is not alone. In all Western countries, the wage gap is similar, between 17 to 30 percent, all across the board, regardless of education, in both public and private sectors. The World Economic Forum publishes an annual gender gap index among 142 developed countries. In 2014, Israel ranked at poor 65, down from last year's 53 position. A number of Israeli social change organizations came together to try and close the gap in a new project funded by the European Union. Everybody is surprised to understand, to see that they have wage gaps. Everybody thinks of themselves as... Um, as the benevolent employer and everyone <laughs> that we've dealt with at least finds wage gaps. The program attempts to both map and gather data regarding wage gaps, as well as offer tools to deal with it. It is the first program to direct efforts at engaging the private sector. Of course, there's the men who, who, who are often suspicious of what will happen to their salaries. Uh, what, we, what we're trying to say to employers is it eventually 
it will come as a duty. It will eventually it will be in the legislation. We see that happening in Canada. We see that happening in Australia. We're working on it together here in Israel. Israeli laws forbid gender discrimination. Stronger enforcing sanctions are required. This summer, Israeli Parliament passed two amendments to its laws. The first requires public companies to disclose wages according to gender. The second strengthens sanctions regarding discrimination. By Israeli law, you can only sue the differences of pay, which means that if you earn 10,000 shekels and the men earned uh, 15,000 shekels, you can only sue for 5,000 shekels uh, for each month you worked. We're trying to, we, what we tried to do and we succeeded was to, may, to, give the, to give the possibility to sue for compensation for the, for the mere fact that you were discriminated by, uh, because you're a woman. Private sector wage gaps may be explained by market forces, but the public sector should lead the way in creating an equal work environment. Limor Livnat, Minister of Culture and Sports, also heads the government's Women's Promotion Committee. In the conference, she called women to ask, check and compare their compensation and detailed new efforts made by the government to rectify the situation by adopting recommendations of a special civil service commission examination into women's promotion in the public sector. In five years, half of the executive management, the highest management positions in the public sector, will be held by women. The ministers and office executive directors are personally obligated to execute this decision and the Civil Service Commission is following it up. Offices who will not comply will not be allowed to hire new employees. The committee also recommended to put ministers, executive directors directly in charge of equal transparent compensation distribution. So Israel mines the gap, but will it close in five years? That remains to be seen. Very much remains to be seen. And Karen, you know, what the thing that bothers me about this is that, you know, I've been in, in our business for like 20 some years. I remember back in, you know, back in the day, there was the call of you know, pay equality. I'm talking about the United States yeah. and a lot of women in the news business where I was working were investigating and found out that they were making 20% in parallel positions, 20% less um, uh, than the men in, in similar positions. So we haven't really progressed an ounce in many ways. We have a little, little, little, li little bit. Uh, yeah. um, two weeks ago, the um, uh, econ World Economic Forum came out with the fantastic decision that the gap is going to close in 81 years. Oh, great. 2095. For my grandchildren. Yes. You're okay. That's yes. not so long ago, you know, <laughs> so long from now. From now. Right, only 81 years. Yes, yeah. great. But, but you know, the, there, there really remains to be seen and, and to, it, it requires significant change. And I think that the, the most important thing is that as long as um, compensation is counted by hours, we'll always be disadvantaged and not by productivity. Right. Because we can be efficient. <laughs> Everyone can be efficient. I think it's good no, no, for the I, workforce. I, think, I, I don't think people realize, and I, I, you know, you see that only you know, in, in your older age. We can be efficient. We can juggle. Yes. It's the one. You're, you're looking at me. It's the one place where anything I would anything I would say would be bad. Yes. I cannot say one not good one thing. Not one word. Yeah. Sit there and not, smile. Not sure. <laughs> not sure. But the the one area where efforts are being made and, and in a different way and perhaps that will that will be the way to where? change things a little bit is uh, the public awareness sphere. That's true. I mean, people are talking about it a lot more. It's not just within companies, whatnot. I did not really understand how Israel looks at combating it, you know, that as, as you mentioned throughout the piece, the more leave not the minister. Well, uh, and there, is a, there is a new decision of a, a civil service commission um, that was adopted by the government and made into a government decision that in five years, all uh, executive positions in all ministerial offices and other public yeah. civil service commissions uh, will be 50 percent women. Um, they, each office received uh, like right. a, like a data information. So that's what they, that's of, uh, you're supposed to nominate 20 people for this uh, throughout your uh, right. um, your office and and whatever, and the the commission is supposed to follow it up, and but to freeze positions. You won't be able to supposedly you won't be able to hire. But you know in Israel decisions made <laughs> to five years from now. <laughs> <laughs> that in itself I'll, is no. That in itself is funny, and I also think you know. So, so they're guaranteeing what female position. Well, well, I don't know. I mean, so females are going to basically then give you know equal pay to other it, females. I, th I think in in places where that that's actually been executed and done, it has it has, it has made, even in the you know in the work environment, because then you're made more aware of the fact that you can be efficient in less hours. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and juggle. 
And you juggle. can do seven things and at there is, one time. And, and there is one thing I really, really want you to see, and that's a, a new campaign. Yes. Okay. From the U.S. Coming up. Sarah yeah. Silverman. Let's just start with by saying, Sarah Silverman, let's take a look. Oh, hi. I'm Sarah Silverman, writer, comedian, and vagina owner. Women make up almost half the working population, yet we typically earn just 78 cents to every dollar a man makes in almost every profession, like doctors, lawyers, teachers, miners, and even the oldest profession of them all, tailors. Every year, the average woman loses around $11,000 to the wage gap. Over the course of the working years of her life, that's almost 500 grand. That's a $500,000 vagina tax. <laughs> I know how I can come off vagina tax. Yes. With a, yes, yes, yes. But as proud vagina owners, I just said that on air. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And, and we've actually cut out the, you know, Interesting, interesting part of bit. what she's going to do with herself to not be that yeah, kind of owner that anymore. That kind of owner because maybe that will give her equal pay yes. and more rights as yes. a worker. Uh, yeah. We love Sarah Silverman. She yeah. takes on the Pope and the world. Yes, yes. yes. And, and you know, maybe these kind of things will, you know, make well, a difference. It's awareness. It's all about awareness. And this is the time to check if actually this is like sifted and made sense to the only man in the studio. <laughs> Who right now wants to bury himself? No. Oh, Why would I want to bury myself? <laughs> what embarrassing thing has happened to me in the past Clearly. six or seven minutes? <laughs> Nothing. How <laughs> red am I? <laughs> Jonathan Ragev, not a vagina owner. Brave. Brave to be in the studio now. Always. I've always been brave. Oh, brave. And not only that, you're here to represent a sports show. Yes. What could be more? Yeah, Maybe I should say, mmm. <laughs> yeah. So, yes, Jonathan Ragev. Host, anchor of the sports edition, the sports show. Absolutely, absolutely. Yes. And what do you have for us today? Well, you know, as you've said, it's winter outside already. It's cold, but Ooh. summer was not a long time ago. Operation Protective Edge was was um, happening around here. Took its toll on many uh, aspects of life. So did it on sports. The south of Israel, the the um, Israeli communities surrounding the Gaza Strip were a major hub for amateur football. Oh. The, and the teams were um, the, the struck by uh, the the the war. Basically, all their operation was uh was shut was down, stopped, shut yeah. down absolutely now it's starting to um re happening again the teams are, st are starting to play again and we had a very nice event this past thursday in tel aviv to promote this team take Let's a take look football has always been a tool for helping others and making a difference the beautiful game continues to show the world time and time again how people rise up and give back in times of need. Such was the case this past weekend in Tel Aviv. The past summer's Operation Protective Edge impacted many, but most notably the ones closest to the Gaza Strip. Kibbutz Mefalsim was one of the worst affected communities in southern Israel, located less than two kilometers from the Gaza border. While the rocket stopped, many are still hurting from this past summer. Despite the great challenges, Organizations like Mifalot have come together to create a wonderful night of football. All the money that's raised from this initiative is actually part of a much bigger initiative to raise money to help children living along the Gaza border. The tournament featured great players and even former Israeli football star Nir Levine. The former striker showed off his talents on the pitch. Despite his age, the beloved Israeli moved around the field swiftly and also scored a brilliant goal. <laughs> It's a great uh, tournament, it's a great uh, atmosphere, um, the players are uh, really serious uh, with the attitude uh, to the game, to the tournament. Football players were not the only ones to be seen on the pitch. The first Israeli tennis player to win a Grand Slam, Andy Rahm, was also at the tournament and showed everyone that he too can keep up on the football pitch. The tennis player provided goals for his team and also knows how important it is for everyone to be part of this event. Seriously, it's a great tournament. Uh, the occasion, we, at the end of the day, it's uh, everybody volunteering, volunteering, coming for a good reason, for a good cause. And uh, if we can have fun and help some kids and some people who are in some problems during the war. And so that's the minimum we can do, you know, some athletes or people here in Israel. 
The ability to raise money in a fun and special atmosphere is also a very important part of the tournament. We come here for the cause and it's it's really important uh, citizens of uh, around uh, you know in around Gaza suffered so much uh, during the summer. So we are trying to do anything we can for them. The game itself is bigger than just people and combine the love for football with helping others. I think it's amazing the fact that we're raising money for children of the South. It's really worthwhile and obviously we get to play football as well. So nothing's better than that. Obviously today is a great event. I'm enjoying myself a lot and uh, let's hope we can win. Kibbutz Mefalsim on the Gaza border is where all the funds from the initiative are going towards and they're happy to be part of this special event. The area is suffering for so long and I think they deserve it, the kids deserve it and it's a great opportunity for us to come and play with Tel Aviv, teams and everybody. Team Kibbutz Mefalsim can be especially proud winning the event. This fantastic opportunity brought players together for a great cause and gave something for all the players to enjoy. With music, this six-a-side competition really captured the great cause of helping those who are hurting. The beautiful game continues to shine amongst the world. How much money was raised, do we know? A, f uh, a, few, uh, a few tens of thousands of shekels going to the teams over there in the south. And uh, let, let, let's face it, um, these teams are suffering, they, they, especially during uh, the months of July and August. That's the time there's no school, so it's the time when kids can come and train the whole day. And they couldn't. They had to stay home in the shelters all the time. And, and they, were, they were missing the time. They were missing the money. Now it's finally, the, the money's finally there. And, and things were... Uh, are, Soccer area, like the Brazilians and Argentinians. Absolutely, and absolutely. Yeah. You go, you go. You, we There's not much to do, so you play soccer. And plus, we heard, we heard, we heard, um, we heard the different accents. And yes, it's it's a kibbutzim with Brazilians, with Argentines, with um, um Brits over there also. Yeah. So a lot of people, and that's what they do. And all this operation uh, uh, was stopped during the summer. Now it's finally. Um, happening again. Let's just hope they don't have to stop for another operation no, soon. Amen, and for all Absolutely, of us. Yeah. And we have very little time, but there's something you have to tell me about Messi. Leo Messi yeah. scored his goal number 253 in La Liga, breaking the former record of 251. This is how his team celebrated with him. How? And uh, just by throwing, up, throwing up, up, in the air. up in the air. Nice one. Yes, and 253. The guy's 27. He can play for 10, for more, 10 years more years and score many more goals. Who knows? Messi's gone. And we'll have all the information about Messi and everything else tonight on when? Talking Football, 7.40 Israel time, that's 6.40 Central European time. Tonight it's Spain and England, tomorrow it's Germany and France. All the information about the football over the weekend, including Messi's record, and much, much, much, much, much more. more. You've heard it here, folks. Folks, first, Talking Football is the show you need to watch, but you are watching I-24 News. Good morning, Emma. Sorry, the morning edition. <laughs> Let their friends. One like, thing at a time. One thing at a time. Yes, morning yes. edition, exactly. And thank you for staying with us. You should check in, of course, for that football thing. <laughs> and of course, tomorrow morning <laughs> for that football thingy. Thingy. And yeah, do not forget to start your morning with I24 News Morning Edition, as you should be doing every single day. So stay with us. Goodbye. <laughs>